Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 302 featuring Carl Lee of uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Uh, an incredibly bright person who's done some really cool work, right, Kristen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm hmm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's uh, he's uh, he's one of the main engineers, one of the engineers that's working on the Hyperion render. And I know a lot of people are curious about the Hyperion render. Uh, it was really great to hear about that and what that means and how how the Hyperion render is working for him and and all these different things that are going on, uh, especially about ray tracing. We talk about ray tracing quite a bit in this uh, and the theories behind ray tracing, especially when you contrast Hyperion to things like V-Ray and what they're meant for. Uh, it was really great to hear that conversation. And uh, I, when I recorded it, Vlado was extremely excited and he actually asked me if I could give him an early version of the podcast because he wanted <laughs> to hear it before anyone else did. So Vlado's are very excited about it. And uh, it was really great. It was really great to have him on. What are some of your other thoughts about it, uh, Kristen? Uh, well, like you said, he's just like super bright, like just the talent he like talks about. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. Like his career path is also like a little different than like you would have expected. Uh -huh. He kind of talks about that. And that's just an awesome story in itself. So yeah, it, it was really lots of info in this. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, you're right. His education was kind of all, you know, was first of all, extremely good education, but also mm -hmm. kind of went all kinds of different paths and choices that he made along the way. So it was really kind of cool to see that uh, for sure. All right, uh, Kristen, we have a couple of announcements. What's going on? Yes, so you can find these out at chaosgroup.com slash events. Um, first one is we've talked about this a lot. It's the illumination challenge. It's a student rendering challenge and the deadline is November 30th. So almost, almost there. Um, and then on November 19th through 20th, uh, we have Elm Tech V-Ray 5 for SketchUp Masterclass Series. Yep. So you can sign up online for that. And then November 23rd, um, it's the power of V-Ray 5. Um, and it's just going to be another like kind of series on that. Mm -hmm. And two more quick things. November 24th is a webinar, um, for V-Ray 5 for 3ds Max in Russian. And, uh, the 24th through 26th of the November is chaos days online. So, and that's in India. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Lots of going, fun stuff. Lots of stuff going on. <laughs> Absolutely. And all of this information is on chaosgroup.com slash events. And they're all online events, so you can just register for them mm -hmm. there, right? Perfect. Yep. Great. Okay. Really cool to have that. Uh cool. And if people want to know more about the podcast, where can they go, Kristen? You can go to facebook.com slash CG Garage Podcast or chaosgroup.com slash CG Garage. Perfect. And if you guys have any other ideas or you would like to, you know, have some different guests on or you input anything you want to do, you can, of course, email us. Labs at chaosgroup.com is our email. Also want to remind you guys that these are in, on video form as well, and they're up on our Chaos Group TV uh, channel on YouTube, as well as on the, on the as we mentioned earlier, the Facebook page which is facebook.com slash CG Garage Podcast. And I think that's about it. Right, Kristen? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay, great. With that being said, please enjoy this awesome podcast with Mr. Carl Lee of Walt Disney Animation. Welcome to another CG Garage where the chaos group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're going to fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray And while image-based lighting is really swell You need to make sure everything has for now Nice shirt, by the way. Oh, Walt thanks. Disney. Thank you very much. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, that's really cool. That's really cool. So how long have you been at Disney? Uh, a little over five years now. Okay. Okay, five years. And you are, I'm assuming, so you've been working in the software department or, I don't know if there's a, such a thing as a software department, but you've been doing rendering. You've been working on Hyperion probably since the beginning, right? Um, so yeah, I'm in the, the software department. We call it the technology department, but so right. that's what it is. Um, yeah. I've been on Hyperion since very, since, uh, well, not, not, not a, actually not really from the beginning at all. Um, so Hyperion kind of, I guess it depends on how you count. Um, sure. 
So Hyperion actually started development in 2011, I think. Um, okay. okay. And it was in development for like quite a long time before it was first used on Big Hero 6. And then I joined right. um, shortly after Big Hero 6. Okay. And so, so what is your background? So let's figure this out. So let's, let's go to your origin story here. So how, what got you to become sort of into rendering or stuff like that? What, what, obviously, computer graphics was part of your history at some point, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, back, in, like, back when I was in like, middle school and high school, my, my younger brother and I uh, messed around a lot of work. We messed around a lot with, like, at the time, Macromedia Flash. I guess now it's Adobe <laughs> Flash. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, and then from there, we kind of like, you know, we were messing around with just like programming in Flash and doing stupid 2D game yeah. stuff. And then we kind of wanted to start doing 3D stuff and we had no idea where to even begin. Okay. Um, and so like at some point I downloaded like a very early version of Blender. Back then the UI to Blender kind of looked like the, the cockpit of the space shuttle. And it was just... <laughs> Like now it's way better, but back then yeah. it was just completely inscrutable. And so, what year are we talking about? This must have been the early two thousands, or yeah, maybe? this is. I okay. think this is like early two thousands ish, like maybe mm-hmm. two thousand five, two thousand six ish. Um, okay. Like I downloaded a Pavre, which yes, a bit of a flashback. I have a people. story for you. <laughs> yes, I have a story for people. Uh, uh, I was on the beach uh, in uh, Pismo Beach. And I ran into this guy who uh, my daughter befriended his daughter. Uh, and so we were just chatting. Oh, you know, how are you doing? Stuff like that. Turns out that guy was the guy who invented Pavre. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Of all things, the run into him at the beach. <laughs> well, I mean, which beach was yeah. it? Was it the Trojan horse? Was, was it Unicorn Pismo- Beach? Because that would make a lot of sense. The- <laughs> yes, of course, of course, of course. No, it was Pismo Beach. It was very, very interesting. Uh, oh, okay. his, uh, his name was uh, Drew Wells. Is his name? It was very interesting. Uh, but okay, so yeah, so you, so you're, so now you're looking at like uh, open source software like Blender and Pavre and that kind of stuff, and just sort of messing around with that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And at some somehow, I don't really remember how, but somehow we actually got our hands on like a like I think like a trial copy of Maya or something. Okay. Um, and we had no idea like what Maya was, and we had no idea that you needed like. Well, okay, we I think at the time Maya was still like, maybe it was already on Windows back then, but um, yes, by then like, it was. Yeah, at, at, so we we had no idea what Maya was, and we had no idea that you needed like a serious workstation for Maya, <laughs> yeah. and it wouldn't run on you know a home computer laptop <laughs> sort of yep. setup. Yep. So that that kind of like. That experiment died pretty quickly. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then, uh, yeah. And then throughout all of high school, I kind of thought I was going to be like a physics major or something like that. Okay. Um, until and your I actually, brother, your you said you were doing this with your brother. So your brother and you, it seems like you guys were like into the same kind of stuff and programming. And stuff, yeah, right? yeah, we are. And actually, my brother is actually in the graphics industry today. As well. Oh, okay. Is he older or younger than you? He's younger. Or is it younger? Two and a half okay. Younger than me. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. We wound up going to the same school and <laughs> going to the same program. And so you thought you were going to be industry. a yeah. Okay. So you thought you were going to be a physics person. And then what school did you end up getting into? Um, so I went to the University of Pennsylvania. And oh yeah. Right before I was apl- deciding what schools to apply for, I don't know. I don't know like how this happened and. It's like a mystery to my parents and to my brother and everybody that knows me. And it's something of a mystery to myself. I decided to apply for business school instead. Um, so okay. I applied to the, the Wharton school and I got in. And on my All first right. day of business school, I realized, oh, my gosh, I've made a terrible mistake. This was a bad idea. I don't like this. Right. It's not for me. Um, but it's really fortunate that, like, by sheer coincidence, and I had no idea about this at the time, but. By sheer coincidence, um, the engineering school at Penn has this program called uh, Digital Media Design, which is like a focused computer graphics program that's kind of embedded within the larger computer science department there. Um, Right. And so I don't really remember how this happened, but I met the director of that program, who's this uh, person named Amy Calhoun. um, And she was really amazing. She was like, after talking with me, she was like, hey, you should just like 
come to this program because clearly you don't like business school. Um, right. So I, I, I actually went to the business school and I was like, hey, I want out. Um, I'd like to transfer <laughs> to the engineering school. And they kind of looked at me really funny and they were like, nobody in 10 years has like asked us to do that. We don't even know like what paperwork you would need to proceed with that because nobody ever transfers out of the business school. People only transfer in. Um, right. <laughs> so, so I wanted out, but, um, but they weren't able to really figure out how. So I actually uh -huh. wound up completing the entire like business degree really? program, finance classes and marketing classes and that kind of stuff. Um, but it turns out really? that like if you uh, don't particularly care that much about going into business with a business degree, you can, uh, you can skate through that entire program in like basically two and a half years, which leaves a lot of time to go take computer graphics and computer science classes instead which is what I did. <laughs> um, That's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And so, I don't know, I kind of described, I guess on paper, like basically what it so looks So you like. have an MBA or? Oh, uh, no, it's, no, it's just a Bachelor of Science and Economics um, or something like okay. that. I, okay. I don't actually remember what it's called because I don't look at that piece of paper. Or, <laughs> But you took a whole lot of computer graphics. Did you do double major? Did you were able to actually double major? No. Stuff, so on, on paper, I have no computer graphics <laughs> credentials whatsoever. Wow. Aside from just, I took a lot of classes and eventually TA'd all most of those classes. Um, really? So the, the way that I describe it is like on paper, what it actually looks like is that my current job is really just a hobby that has gone like wildly out of control. <laughs> <laughs> and on paper, I'm, I don't know. I, I think I'm supposed to be a uh, marketing. That's so fascinating because it sounds like you took a whole lot of computer graphics classes, right? So if you took yeah. all these computer graphics classes, uh, would you didn't have to actually do the requirements. You just did what you wanted to do in a sense. Yeah, right? yeah. In a way, it actually <laughs> kind of worked out in sort of a strange way. Like I, I didn't have to take, um, I don't know, I didn't have to take like specific requirement classes. Science yet. classes or whatever. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Okay, so you did. So you basically took took the things you wanted to do, which was awesome, uh, and and then you you know graduated from uh, from the, from the Wharton School, which is really funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and then uh, and then what what happened from there? How did you you know what did you, what did you look at in terms of your career? Yeah. So um, along the way, uh, I uh, so in my at the end of my sophomore year, I. Uh, applied for an internship at Pixar, and I okay. got it. So as part of this uh, thing that Pixar has called the uh, Pixar Undergraduate Program, which is sort of a, it's sort of like a classroom-ish internship program that's very specifically targeted at undergrads and like underclassmen. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically this like ten-week program where they put you through this crash course of just learning the entire Pixar pipeline, and um, you know you get to work with and get taught by like amazing people there and yeah um yeah so i i did that it was really eye-opening um and from there i kind of like the, the kind of takeaway i had from that was like wow i really love lighting um i'm i'm really bad at traditional art of all types but the what the area that i'm the least bad at is like mm. painting <laughs> okay and and i really like you know photography and i love you know doing stuff with like physical lights and whatever and so Lighting just made a lot of sense. Right. Um, and you'd already had experience with that from Blender and Pavre. So you yeah, exactly. had a little bit yeah. of a taste of it for, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I started trying to, you know, light stuff in Maya at school using uh, whatever the built-in was, Mental Ray. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is pretty hard and not great and really slow. And right. Uh, and then the other option that, you know, I kind of knew from Pixar was like old Reyes style render man, yep. which our school had a, you know, had lic like educational licenses or whatever too. But mm -hmm. it turns out that using like old Reyes style render man without the entire set of like stuff that most studios had built around it, yep. it's like really hard. <laughs> yes. Agreed. <laughs> it's like, where's the GI yeah. button? Oh, there is yeah. none. Cause that's none. not a thing. That's um, not a real thing. You have to yeah. build that yourself. <laughs> yeah. And then yep. I saw um and then I saw the third and the seventh, which 
I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Which has come up on this podcast a lot before, I think. Yep. Um, and I was like, what? This is like one person? Like, how, how is this possible? Uh-huh. And so I started looking into it and I was like, oh, V-Ray. All right. This guy uses V-Ray and he made this. So I'm using V-Ray. So okay. I went to um, the head of our program and I basically just pestered them and wrote emails and knocked on doors for like, you know, half a year until somebody finally was like, okay, you know what? Like we will buy the school educational V-Ray licenses if you just like go away for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so I got us like, you know, V-Ray licenses in our, in our computer lab. And then I was doing stuff in V-Ray. And at some point I was just like, man, like I, I, this is so cool. Um, I really wonder how like V-Ray actually works under the hood. So I started reading about, you know, ray tracing and path tracing and at the time, like yeah. you know, radiance caching and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And at some point I was like, you know what, I bet I could write my own renderer and then I'll just make my pictures using my own renderer. And then I won't have to pester people for licenses and I won't have to like not know what any of the options or controls are because I'll have written the whole thing myself. So I was right. like, well, I, I know how to program. And so I'll, I think I'll, that's how Andra started. And that's how he <laughs> ended up making uh, that's how we <laughs> end up making uh, Corona render. So the yeah, Corona yeah. Render, I, yeah. I actually remember his like his like very early Corona development threads on yep. some forum. I don't remember what forum it was, but yeah, I, 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 I was actually looking at that stuff when I kind of started trying to write my own renderer as well. And being okay. like, being, you know, exactly the right combination of like incredibly overconfident and like yep. incredibly not knowledgeable in my head, I was like, all right, six weeks, write my own renderer, get back to lighting. And yep. six weeks has now turned into like 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So you're still, but you're still, okay. So you're still writing your own render on top of writing Hyperion as well? Um, sort of not. Uh, so I still kind of keep my own hobby renderer going. It's mostly, yeah. um, at this point, it's mostly just a platform for, for like continuing to keep my own knowledge up to date. Like if there's yep. a cool paper that I read and I, I want to play with how it works. You know, I'll. You have something to own. work on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But that, that's kind of its main purpose. It's really just sort of a toy, you know, research experimentation platform. Right. Right, yeah. right, right. Which is awesome. Which is awesome. Okay. So, so, all right. So you, you did there. You, so the Pixar thing happened after school. It happened after school, right? Uh, so the, the, the Pixar thing happened after my sophomore year. After, then, oh, okay. And then after my junior year, uh, I got an internship at DreamWorks, uh-huh. um, which was a, it was really interesting to see kind of a different studio and to see how yep. um, how similar and how different they were. Mm-hmm. Uh, from what I I don't know the details behind this, but from what I understand, like way back in like the eighties, the uh, the Pixar guys and the PDI guys used to you know talk with each other a lot, and so there okay. were a lot of like. Like when I was at Pixar, um, I was there kind of right as their uh, their kind of older generation of tools that had been in use since like the eighties was starting to mm-hmm. be phased out, and they're starting to adopt like what are now their modern tool set. The full ray tracer, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I was kind of at DreamWorks at the same time when, when a lot of their older tools were kind of starting to be sunsetted but we're still in use and so it was interesting right. seeing like oh wow like you know the, the the animation spreadsheet tool at pixar and at dreamworks is almost exactly the same <laughs> like <laughs> clearly these guys you know talk they to were talking yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean that was the time right it was like there was obviously dreamworks and and and, and well pdi it was pdi right that really yeah. kind of wanted the place was well, it was interesting but you were didn't go to pdi you went to dreamworks here in glendale right so, yeah yeah but at that point um the tech between PDI and Glendale was, I think it was pretty much the identical. Same. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's interesting. Well, cool. Okay. So you did a, you did an internship when your junior year at DreamWorks. Yes. And then, and then, and then after that, I guess, obviously, well, what happened after that? Uh, so yeah, after that, um, so there, there was a, there was a couple of my friends, uh, who are at, at Penn who are also kind of all interested in writing renderers. And we had this like little group of basically like, render hobbyist buddies where we were all writing our own path tracers and we were sharing notes with each other and 
you know, nice. trading ideas and stuff. And all of us were kind of, um, we we're kind of being like mentored or shepherded by this uh, PhD student named Joe Kider. Mm -hmm. um, and then Joe Kider, uh, after he finished his PhD, he went to do a postdoc at Cornell uh, okay. with Professor Don Greenberg, uh -huh. um, who's like, you know, this legendary, like godfather of computer graphics type figure. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, during my senior year, uh, Joe Kider kind of pinged a whole bunch of us and he was like, hey, are any of you interested in coming up to the Cornell lab? Because uh, Don Greenberg is looking for, you know, a couple of like research master students to, to work here for and, you know, learn here for like a couple of years and work on some interesting stuff. Um, right. And so uh, I wound up doing that. And then uh, one of my uh, good friends uh, named Peter Cutts was kind of the best in our sort of little render cabal. Um, mm -hmm. he, he turned down that offer because he got an offer to join the Hyperion team at Disney, uh, ah. which will come back later. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, he kind of went off to, to Disney to work on, at the time, you know, unannounced, unspecified rendering project, which I thought right. was strange because I was like, everybody knows Disney is like a render man house. Like, right. what is that they do there? They, they own render man. <laughs> yeah, they, they, at the point they own render man. So you know, that yes. was like, okay, sure. Um, yeah. Well, we'll get to that. I'm curious about that whole <laughs> philosophy in a second. But anyway, keep sure. going, keep going with your story. Um, so uh, summer between my senior year and before going to Cornell, I uh, went back to Pixar and I uh, did an internship at Pixar Research, where I worked uh -huh. on uh, I worked on kind of this prototype GPU path tracer that uh, eventually became this tool, this in-house tool called RTP, which was it's basically a real-time path tracer used for like look dev right. review sort of stuff. I guess kind of like V-Ray GPU back in the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then after that, I kind of went to the Cornell lab and then I was at the Cornell lab for two years working on a whole bunch of kind of cool research projects. Um, yep. I got an interesting kind of side note there is like my office door was two doors down the hall from where uh, Yaroslav Kravonvik's yep. door used yep. to be. Um, oh. I, I didn't overlap with him. I missed him by like, I think two years. Maybe. Well, I'll explain to people yeah. who, who that is in case they don't, they don't know for the audience. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so Yaroslav is, um, uh, he, he, he was one of the, like, I think like real titans of like the, the rendering research field. Um, right. He, uh, you know, he, uh, basically like a lot of the sort of modern, um, sort of important sampling techniques and like online learning techniques that are used in rendering were all pioneered by him and his students, uh, yeah. out of their lab at Charles university. Um, yeah. Uh, Yaroslav was also, he's also connected to. Uh, chaos group, of course, because uh, yep. he he was kind of one of the uh, founders of uh, what became the Corona renderer. And then yep. when that was bought by Chaos Group, you know, he, he kind of he's been on the podcast. Yeah, course, his yeah. episode on the podcast is, was really really good. Um, yes, but unfortunately, he passed away uh, last year. Yeah, which I think um, yeah, it was, it was a real real gut wrenching to the company. Yeah, real gut wrenching. I, I yeah. It, 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 it's really hard to hear because he, yeah, he, he was such a great guy. Like, um, yeah, like the the couple of times I met him at SIGGRAPH and at EGSR, um, which is a rendering conference, uh, he, mm -hmm. he was always like super cool, super approachable. You know, back when I was a student, he actually like talked with me a lot and gave me like tips and, yeah, you know, and so, he had a real, uh, real dry sense of humor too which was quite yeah fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah quite fun. and and uh uh so there's this one year where there's a rendering conference in dublin uh-huh um, and i i was there and with uh one of my one of my teammates and we wound up hanging out with kind of yaroslav and his his students a bit and there's yeah. and being dublin you know it's dublin so you gotta do a bar crawl and like we went on this bar crawl with Yaroslav and his, his students, which was a mistake because I can't hold alcohol like at all. And right. Yaroslav is Czech. <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course. Of yeah. Course. And so like, 
you know, like two bars in, I'm just like, okay, I, I'm got, I have to tap out, guys. I, I have right. to go sleep. Um, right. And then I heard later on that they were at it until like four or five a.m. or something. Wow. You know, <laughs> drinking at every single bar that they hit along the way. And then the next morning they had to present, and they gave like just an <laughs> extremely clear, well articulated, like you know, speaking English better than native English speakers, like <laughs> brilliant presentation. And mm -hmm. I was just like. Where do these people come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah, they're, they're, he's a he's he's a he's a he was a really cool guy. Uh, we will yeah. miss him dearly. Okay, so 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 the Cornell for for a while. So how long were you at Cornell for? Uh, so I was there for two years. Um, okay, and then uh, towards the end of my two years, uh, my friend from Penn, Peter Cutts, kind of reaches out to me and he's like, "Hey, uh, you know, we're building a new renderer from the ground up." and we need people, uh, would you have any interest? And, okay. you know, I, I was like, yeah, of course, you know, that sounds awesome. But I hadn't finished my degree at Cornell yet. Um, mm -hmm. So I went to, you know, Professor Greenberg, and I was like, hey, um, you know, I, I, have this, I have this opportunity to you know, join this, like, rendering team at Disney and, you know, working on, like, you know, one of these big rendering teams is like, you know, was sort of like the end goal for why I came to Cornell in the first place. And, right. and uh, Professor Greenberg was kind of kind enough to, to let me kind of go off and do that before sort of finishing my degree with the kind of agreement that at some point I'll, I'll finish it remotely. Okay. Which I still need to do. Um, <laughs> okay. But, um, but yeah, so then I, I would, I came to LA, came to Disney animation and yeah. joined the Hyperion team. And I've kind of been there ever since. Okay. All right. Well, that's 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 awesome. Well, so that gives us a good history. Now let's talk about the history of Hyperion. It's an, it's an interesting thing. So, like you said, you know, this is this is uh, uh, Hi the Hyperion project, or probably started very soon after uh, the acquisition of Pixar, right? So it must have happened uh, right around the. I think there was like a five or six year gap because the acquisition was like what two thousand six, two thousand seven. Yeah. Okay, something like that. All right. Yeah. And so, so it was, it was, it was but it was after, I guess. So yeah. it was after. Okay. Yeah. So at some point there must've been a decision. It's like, you know, we can use RenderMan, or they have been using RenderMan, uh, and we're going to try to write a different renderer, uh, for, for Disney. Yeah. Um, and what, what was that, uh, what, what led to, what caused that decision to, 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 to take place? Sure. Um, I think there were like a couple of different factors. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them was like 2010, 2011 was when, um, is when the, the industry was starting to move towards like, oh, like full ray tracing for feature films and for VFX and that kind of stuff is, is becoming like actually yes. possible. Like that's when Arnold was starting to gain like a foothold and that's when V-Ray um, was starting to like, really take off and gain a lot of traction in the um, film industry in the film industry yes v, <laughs> right, v ray right. you know is very very well established kind of right. arc biz and stuff yeah uh, long before then but in film that's kind of when when you had a lot of studios who were starting to like move off of old ray as rasterization and move to v ray and arnold and right. um yep and so you know experimentation started at disney as well to just explore like ray tracing um or like full ray tracing, you know, not not this like right. hybrid. Ray and tracing at that, that point, at that, at that right, yeah. But at that point, did RenderMan have a full ray tracer, or was it still doing sort of its hybrid ray tracing at that time? Uh, it was still doing its hybrid ray tracing. Ah, uh, okay, um, okay. Like I think the modern ray traced version of RenderMan, uh, I think it's if I remember correctly, the the first betas for it kind of started dropping in like twenty. 13 ish 2014 ish but okay you know disney kind of was already experimenting before that okay um, and then uh you know big hero 6 was in development and they already knew from pretty early on that big hero 6 was going to have like extremely large scale sets like you know many orders of magnitude larger than anything that disney animation had handled before um, right is going to you know the, the art direction for the film uh, was kind of calling for this like very like photorealistic type of lighting with like a lot mm -hmm. of you know GI um, and 
you know, with kind of the old hybrid version of RenderMan, um, the the studio just like wasn't really sure how to how to hit that look and hit that yeah. scale. Uh, yeah. And the kind of early experiments with the path tracing project that eventually became Hyperion were super promising. Like they showed that like, oh man, like ray tracing, we can scale way further than we can with rasterization. And, you know, you GI is like way better than having to manage like shadow maps and <laughs> yeah, uh, like a PBGI, like brick map files and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, and so kind of they, they kind of just looked at where uh, like what the timeline for the film was and like what the timeline for, you know, the eventual like path trace version of RenderMan was. And it just made more sense to kind of push ahead Start. with the internal project and because it could deliver in time for the movie. Right. Yeah. Now the Hyperion, I mean, there's a, like you said, there's a, there's a lot of ray tracers out there, right? Mm -hmm. There's and, and, and honestly speaking, they're all, they're different, but they're also very similar philosophically, right? So like RenderMan, uh, sorry, uh, well, even RenderMan, uh, but V-Ray and Arnold and even Mental Ray a little bit and Corona, uh, they're all similar. And even the GPU renders are all very similar in terms of what they do. But Hyperion is a, has a, philosophically does something very, very different <laughs> that <Yeah>. <laughs> allows for very big stuff to happen, which is, which would be really great if you could sort of help describe, like if like, C compared to like, let's say V-Ray, how is Hyperion philosophically different, funda sure. or fundamentally different? Yeah. Um, so the part where it might be useful to talk about the similarities first, like- Sure, let's do that. Um, you know, like the, the similarity level across all of the sort of modern path tracers is that they're all running essentially the same math. Um, like right. the path tracing math is very well established. It's, um, you know, the, all of, like the, the, the rendering equation and you know, how you do like important sampling and all that kind of stuff is, is pretty standard across everything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, di different renders will uh, innovate on top of it in different ways. Like, you know, V-Ray has its, uh, uh, like it's a adaptive, you know, many lights solution, which mm -hmm. is sort of a, you know, much more advanced extension on top of how you would typically do light selections inside of path tracing and, right. you know, Hyperion has its own thing and whatever, but the, the underlying math and like fundamentals are all the same. Right. Um, so where a lot of the differences come in are, well, on the technical side, on the interface side, you know, there's, they're all very, they're actually like, you know, a lot of differences and a lot of sure. specializations, but then on the more technical side, um, how you kind of choose to implement this math and how you engineer the render internally, um, a lot of the renders are very, very different from each other. Right. Um, so V-Ray, uh, V-Ray kind of, uh, my understanding is V-Ray takes sort of a, what's called a depth first approach to path tracing. So, okay. you know, when you fire a ray through a pixel, um, you follow that ray until it hits a surface, you evaluate the, uh, the surface shader, you generate a BSDF, you sample a light, and then you continue along that, uh, that path. So, you know, the ray bounces off that surface and it goes off and it bounces off of another surface and another surface and so on and so right. forth until it's done. Um, right. So it's step first because you know, you're, you're tracing each path as deep as it goes yes. um, before proceeding to the next path. Right. Uh, so Hyperion takes what's called a breadth first approach. Um, breadth first. Breadth okay. first. So the idea is instead of like firing a ray through a pixel and then following it to its, uh, to its completion, right. um, Instead, Hyperion fires the first ray for every single pixel at the same time for one okay. SVP or two SVP or eight SVP right. or whatever. And then it'll trace all of those rays together, uh, have them all hit the same, you know, or all hit whatever surfaces they hit. Uh, and then Hyperion will take all of the... But just one hit. Just one hit, exactly. Okay. And then Hyperion will, uh, will take all of the shading points. It'll sort them. Uh, so that um, so that Hyperion can create like basically coherent batches of work. So you know all of these rays are requesting to evaluate the same shader because they hit the same surface. So we can group all of those shaders together, um, and then we can execute them all together because uh, you know executing many like executing batches of similar instructions uh, is. Um, is more optimal for kind of modern day 
processors and for memory access reasons and that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, and then, you know, after Hyperion has kind of evaluated all of the shaders for this entire like first bounce, it'll then fire all the rays for the second bounce. And when it fires all the rays for the second bounce, it'll sort all of them as well and group them by um, direction uh, and by starting point and a whole bunch of other metrics so that right. Hyperion can trace kind of like, okay, all of these rays are kind of going in this direction at the same time so we can trace all of them together. And the idea there is that if all of these rays kind of hit the same object at the same time, then, you know, if hypothetically your scene doesn't fit in memory uh, and you kind of have to go out of core, well, then if all of these rays are hitting this object and this object and this object isn't in memory, then it needs to be loaded into memory. So it's better to load it in memory at once and then amortize the load costs across all of these rays at the same time, as opposed to like, you know, just doing it totally randomly. Um, but it also sounds like you need a lot of memory. <laughs> you do, yeah. Because you, you need have more to memory than traditional rendering to do this, Yes, you right? do. So you have to store kind of the, the entire state of like all of these rays at the same time, which does right. take like a considerable amount of memory. Um, right. So there's various trade-offs yeah. there. Like yeah. one of the... Uh, um, this is kind of stepping back a little more from the technical. And, sure. Uh, but... I think one of the interesting things about developing Hyperion uh, versus working on um, you know, something like V-Ray is that uh, since, since V-Ray has an extremely broad and extremely diverse user base, uh, yep. V-Ray kind of has to run well on a, a very large spectrum of hardware. Like, you know, you have users and who user, are- And use cases too. And use cases, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so um, V-Ray is, you know, it's much more general and it's, uh, it's extremely flexible to a number of different workflows, and that makes it, you know, a, a fantastic tool for, um, you know, many many different users. Uh, Hyperion, on the other hand, since it has a single customer in a single building, <laughs> um, in a single use case, <laughs> in a single use case, uh, yep. and it actually runs on like a fixed set of hardware that we know and we control. It's actually closer to like game console programming than, you know, interesting general because like. There's hard assumptions that like we always know Hyperion is going to have at minimum this amount of memory because we bought all the machines That's with that much memory and we know that it's going to have like exactly this many cores to run on because we bought computers with that many cores. Right. Um, so because of that, Hyperion can um, can be a lot more specialized for sort of the the internal use cases at Disney Animation. Like, does right. that mean like the way that I the way that I like to describe it is like you know. Okay, I, every once in a while I get asked, like, is Hyperion the best renderer in the world? And I'm like, I think that's kind of a dumb question because I think every, right. like, this whole, like, renderer religious war thing that sometimes happens, I, I don't really like because I think, um, you know, I, I, I work I think, for a renderer and I completely agree with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I, you know, V-Ray is a really, really good renderer and, like, RenderMan yep. and Arnold are really good renderers. Yep. You know, if you're, I've, had, uh, I've had Marco song. Yeah, exactly. Know, so, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if, if you're a user, like, you shouldn't just learn one, you should learn yeah. all of them. And yeah. in that sense, I'm like, okay, so, you know, the, the question of, like, is Hyperion, like, the best renderer? Like, I think it's a dumb question, but my answer to that is usually, like, um, you know, Hyperion is, like, the best renderer for Disney animation and for <laughs> Disney animation's very specific requirements and use cases because it's yep. built for Disney animation. Like, for your average user, is it a good choice? Almost certainly not because your typical user is going to have a very different set of requirements and use cases. And for them, right. they, should, they should go use V-Ray or they should right. go use something else. Yeah. Now, is there anything, any, any other render that you know of that is built uh, in a, with a similar philosophy to, of, of Hyperion? Yeah. Um, this is kind of a funny answer. V-Ray GPU. Uh, <laughs> Okay. And, and actually, most GPU renderers. Um, so most GPU renderers are actually built using this uh, breadth-first approach. In the GPU world, you might hear it called um, like wavefront path tracing, or like a wavefront approach, or like a multi-kernel approach. Um, yes, multi-kernel, yeah. Yeah. So we, stad we had a mega-kernel, and then we went to multi-kernel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, right. So uh, I think you guys were kind of one of the, the first GPU renderers to really like discover that. Um, yes. So well, we discovered why why there was a we got really far with the with the with the mega kernel. And then we 
hit a wall in terms of what was possible, especially as we started to add more more features to the render. And then it's yeah. like the, because it was the cliff, you know, like it just started slowing down. So that's when we, we rewrote the entire render <laughs> with, with multi-kernel, uh, which is, you know, the, the V-Ray GPU has been rewritten multiple times because the hardware keeps changing and yeah. the limited, you know, so it's, it's it's quite a project, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. as you can imagine. Yeah. Okay, so explain. Actually, let's do that since you're, you'll you'll be great. Explain what is the difference between a mega kernel and a multi kernel. You'll do a better job than I can. Sure, for sure. <laughs> um, so so in a mega kernel kind of GPU renderer. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, okay. So first, what is a kernel? Um, right. So a program that runs on a GPU is a kernel. Um, okay. Or it's directly. You might be familiar with like a GPU shader. So a kernel is kind of just the, the more generic version of a shader. So a kernel okay. is a, it's a blob of code that runs on the GPU. And on the GPU, you have to, um, you, can't, you can't just kind of like arbitrarily run GPU code the same way that you would run CPU code. The way it works is that uh, your C, like inside of your program that uses the GPU, you typically have CPU code that does some stuff and then mm -hmm. uh, it'll do what's called a kernel launch on the GPU. So it'll basically take a, you know, a program and a bunch of data, and they'll tell the GPU like, "Hey, run this program over this data," and the GPU will kind right. of do its thing, and then, you know, the CPU program will have to copy the results back, or it can leave it on the GPU and tell the GPU to then do something else. And, right. But basically, a kernel is just a—it's a block of code that runs on the GPU. Right. Um, and it used to be shaders, like in the old yeah. days before they had CUDA. So, like when we did our very first in two thousand seven or eight, when we were first experimenting with GPUs. We basically shoehorned V-Ray GPU into a shader. Like yeah, that's it's like all GLSL <laughs> or something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really, really funky. But now it's like this little blob. So it's like, not yeah. like you said, a kernel. Okay. So keep keep going. Sorry. Just yeah. Going. So so in a so a mega kernel is kind of when you just take everything that your program is going to do and you shove it into like one giant kernel. It's called a mega kernel because these kernels where you shove everything in tend to be like huge. Um, right. So in the path tracing realm. Like a depth first path tracer is typically written as like a mega kernel because you have this okay. single big program that's like doing inner ray intersection and pattern generation and BSDF sampling and light sampling and who knows what else. Yeah. Um, right. And it's doing it for every single bounce. Um, right. And uh, the, the nice thing about the mega kernel approach is that um, it's relatively straightforward to take. CPU code, like the CPU path tracer, and just mm -hmm. shove the entirety of it inside of a mega kernel and yep. have it run. And you know that that's often sort of a good sort of like first step. Um, yep. But it turns out that uh, since the GPU hardware is really different, the GPU hardware. Um, so GP, one of the things that CPUs have uh, are these things called branch predictors. So if your code goes down like a if else branch, uh, mm -hmm. CPUs can predict with a like shockingly high degree of accuracy, like you know, usually beyond 95% degree of accuracy, which branch your code is going to take. Um, mm -hmm. But this branch prediction logic uh, on the actual CPU die takes up an enormous amount of space. Mm -hmm. And the whole philosophy behind GPUs is like, OK, instead of having like this fancy branch prediction logic, which takes up an enormous amount of space, what if we just get rid of that and we instead use all that space to just pack on more cores? Yep. So, so because the GPU like ten thousand of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, because it turns out it takes like a huge amount of space on the CPU to do this. Uh, right. It's really funny. Like if you look at like a modern CPU die like layout, the actual cores are like these tiny little things that are like shoved onto the edges and the corners, and the middle is just like this giant block of like other stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and the GPU yep. philosophy is like, okay, let's just get rid of all the other stuff and like put on more cores. Uh, yep. But because the GPU doesn't have stuff like you know branch prediction logic or whatever, uh, yeah. branches are correspondingly you know much more expensive to to run on the GPU because the GPU since it can't guess it kind of has to just try it. try every single option. Um, right. And when you have a mega kernel, the code tends to end up filling up with a ton of branches because that's just what code is. Right. Um, so the philosophy behind this like micro kernel or many kernel or wavefront approaches yeah, to multi kernel yeah yeah is to is to take your program and then split it into a whole bunch of like much more smaller much more digestible pieces and then run those kernels 
separately. And then between each set of kernel launches, you can kind of like sort all of your data or you can kind of examine the results from the previous kernel and then more intelligently select what you do next. Um, right. And kind of the, the, the natural mapping to path tracing is to break up path tracing into sort of a breadth first um, style. Interesting. Yeah. So, Interesting. And, and um, yeah, I think is, you guys have actually kind of uh, sort of presented a lot of stuff about how to do this at uh, like GTC and yeah, um, it's really cool. Well, I that's awesome. I'm I'm really glad. You know, and I think it would be really good <laughs> for people to hear, like people at Disney, like saying, <laughs> "I really like what V-Ray did," and for people at uh, at V-Ray, it's like that's a really interesting approach of what they did. You know, uh, on Hyperion because that is really the, the part of the community. You know, we all give and take from each other a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, and and the respect that Vlado and Andra have for each other is a big you know respect, and it's the users that are creating the the render wars, not the not the developers, yeah, or the coders. I, I, I've noticed that um, on the actual developer side, like everybody's pretty friendly. Um, and oh yeah, everyone's like the really only person virtual. more excited about uh, the only person more excited about having Marcos on the podcast was Vlado. <laughs> <laughs> so he was the most excited about that, and even um, uh, Matt Fairclaw, who did Terrigen, you know, he mm -hmm. was on as well, and so he was very excited about being on and doing that kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, so this is uh, 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 this is fascinating. So you said the GPU code is actually. Uh, uh, works better with the multi-kernel, which is similar to the breadth-first approach that you guys are doing Hyperion. Now, Hyperion yes. is not GPU-based, right? Uh, no, it's not. Yeah, it's CPU okay. only. So, so Hi Hyperion kind of stumbled into this architecture for sort of completely different reasons. Okay. Um, like I mentioned before, like uh, for, for Hyperion, scaling was a big concern, especially like scaling with out-of-core geometry and out-of-core textures and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, which has become less of a like at the time Hyperion was being written, they were thinking about like, oh my gosh, we got to fit this world onto like machines with like 16 gigabytes of RAM. Whereas like now right. the standard production machine has like 200 gigabytes of RAM or something. So okay. this problem in a lot of ways sort of just went away. Went away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I have my my the computer at my desk has you know two forty eight gig cards and they're NV link, so it's ninety six gigs of video memory. I, that's unheard of to yeah. think about. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is crazy. But yes, anyway, so that's really fascinating. So so, but uh, one of the things now, Vlado, and I, I'm probably going to get it wrong, so you can correct me or you can, you know, adjust what I'm saying. One of the things Vlado says what's interesting about the Hyperion render is that. When it's really, really big scenes, Hyperion does very well. Yes. For very simple scenes, Hyperion would actually do not as well as a, a more general purpose ray tracer. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, he, he's exactly right. Um, okay. So Hy Hyperion uh, kind of really flies when it's scaling with like production scale shots and really complex shading and really complex geometry. Um, mm -hmm. But like if you're rendering like a, like a Cornell box, you know, the simplest possible case. Hyperion's actually like a fair bit slower than, you know, a, a path, like a hobby path tracer or something like that. Um, right. And this, this comes back to sort of Hyperion is designed for Disney animations, like very specific use cases and workflows. Like right. the, the, the typical workload at Disney animation is extreme complexity. Um, right. And so Hyperion's meant for that. And then like, you know, relatively simpler scenes. That's just not a thing that we really end up having to to worry too much about. Right, 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 right. Well, that's really, really interesting. Uh, uh, I find that uh, fascinating. Um, okay, I do want to talk a little bit about where you think the next thing is going to be. Because mm -hmm. obviously, I think right now, uh, uh, there's a lot of you know ideas of, you know, one of the things that, that Vlado and I said years and years ago is that, yes, uh, uh, real-time rendering is going to replace eventually uh, rasterized rendering or, or, or offline rendering. <laughs> but rasterized rendering is not going to replace ray tracing. Everything is going to, the ultimate goal is to be fully ray traced and real-time, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and if I'm looking at, for example, you mentioned it before, actually, let's go back to, to what you said before about uh, 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 
uh, Render Man when it had you know the brick maps and all this stuff. Render Man could do at that time quite a bit of complexity, right? It was pretty pretty amazing what it could do, especially you know around the Wally days when 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 they started using the brick maps. That was really sort of one of the big things that they were doing there. But it was still a a rasterizer at at, at its core. Um, the way that I see like the new uh, Unreal Five demo that I'm seeing is like it's at about the Wally level, but yeah. in real time, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So it's got it's able to do huge amounts of geometry as a ray, as a rasterizer, and it's able to do you know ray tracing on top as an effect, <laughs> but not really fully ray traced. What do you think? What do you think is going to be needed to get ray tracing to be fully ray traced? I mean, obviously we're we're doing it in in in, uh, in Lavina. Uh, but what do you think is going to be like sort of the, the thing that's going to that really sort of make that happen besides obviously better GPUs? Yeah, I, I think that um, so, so ray tracing versus rasterization for handling complexity is kind of an interesting topic. Um, yeah. kinda, as you guys have seen with Lavina, um, mm -hmm. like ray tracing can actually scale better to extremely large amounts of ge geometry than yeah. rasterization can. And in fact, like you can actually, you know, just, it, it, um, it's very easy to see like where this like crossover point is because rasterization has to go loop through every single triangle in the scene and splat them to the, you know, frame buffer. Whereas ray tracing uh, kind of reverses that by like, you know, you have a ray that goes into the scene and it doesn't have to, you don't have to do a ray intersection against every single triangle. You typically have this BVH structure that, um, right allows you to kind of like recursively you know rule out entire subsections of the scene and so right. um, if you if you kind of just plot out the curves of like you know how each of these scales you can see this crossover point where ray tracing just will be absolutely dominant once you have enough geometry right um, which is very similar to the Hyperion thing that we were just talking yeah. about it's like yeah okay but I think one area where um, kind of as a field we we don't have a good handle on is um uh, is animated geometry. So, so static geometry and instancing and all that kind of stuff, like we know how to deal with that very efficiently with ray mm -hmm. tracing, you know, the, the hardware is getting really good at it. Um, but like something that's, but the only reason ray tracing is so fast against tons of geometry is because of this like BVH structure you have that we to build. pre-sort that every exactly, time. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's not fast. Um, no. Like it, it's getting faster, you know, the, the NVIDIA well, hardware. Well, every time you hit it. render, you hear preparing scene, right? And that's yeah. what it's doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then if you think about like the requirements for a real-time engine where you're, you're playing back like animated meshes at, you know, 60 FPS or something like that, like we're right. just nowhere even close to being able to, um, to build like the BVH accelerators for that at a rate that, that's fast enough. Um, hmm. So I think that that's sort of like a, uh, an interesting sort of outstanding research topic. Um, okay. I don't really know like what the answer to that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, how, do, <laughs> how, how does it, I mean, how does it happen now? Like, I mean, obviously, you know, you see games that got RT cores, right? Yeah. And are, are they doing RT ray tracing uh, uh, or RTX or whatever they're calling it in, in the, in the, in the GeForce world, uh, but the the they are ray tracing in real time. Technically, yeah. are they using so, simplified geometry? Or are they how are they doing that? Yeah. So so in uh, in most game engines that are doing ray tracing, they're they're typically uh, they're typically ray tracing against like a like a simplified or decimated version of the scene, which has um, you know a, a a polygon count that's low enough that you can build the BVHs fast enough to do real time. Um, Interesting. Or yeah. if stuff, you know, if, if you have something that isn't like, if you're, yeah, if, if you have something that's just kind of playing back a pre cached animation, you can just pre build all of the acceleration structures for every frame. Right. That doesn't work for, you know, interactive and whatever, but. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the larger challenge is um, like, the larger challenge is being able to do this like fast update for you know, full res geometry across an entire giant production scene. Like that, yeah. that's kind of what would be necessary to do uh, fully real time path traced or real time ray traced, um, yep. like, you know, feature film stuff. 
So. Yeah. Well, I remember like, okay, so way back when, uh, 2014, when I first started experimenting with real-time ray tracing, when we did it, when we shoved V-Ray inside of Motion Builder, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> right? And we did the thing for, for Construct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The reason Construct, the reason it worked for Construct, and it was like, it was done on, on, for, on purpose with, with Kevin. It's like, okay, let's make them robots that are yeah, not exactly. deforming geometry yeah. so that we could, the it's only, uh, the only thing that's changing is transforms. Yeah, you know? exactly. So it's like much simpler and we don't have to do deforming and re redoing the cache. So it's not, it's not working that way. Uh, but yeah, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting. So philosophic is, is there, other ways that you could sort geometry <laughs> is there another kind of acceleration tree that could be faster to process or is there going to be do you think there's going to be you know like okay so the 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 new new generation of gpus have, are tackling ray tracing are they going to have another one that's going to tackle <laughs> deforming geometry just on a chip i mean they're, they're shoving so many specialized chips onto these gpus that do different things you know maybe they can do one that will specifically tackle that <laughs> as a as a process yeah i i don't know it's a good question um i think there, there's kind of a whole variety of different sort of different types of acceleration trees and different ways to build, you know, the same types of BVHs and whatever. And in general, mm -hmm. there's always this like uh, build speed versus ray tracing performance trade-off. Like in general, in general, yep. the, the faster the build technique is, the lower quality of a tree it produces. So the slower the ray tracing becomes. Yes. Now, before the advent of like hardware ray tracing, like this was a big deal. Right. Now it's kind of, I, I think that like now the balance is shifting because it's like, well, if you're doing it in hardware anyway, and it goes from like being able to do it in like, you know, one two hundredth of a second versus one one hundred and fiftieth of a second, like, right. does it matter <laughs> that much? Right, right, right. I don't right. know. <laughs> as long as you're like below, you know, 24 yeah, frames exactly. a second or 30 frames a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's interesting to think about that because it is, it, there there that was the thing, right? And especially in, 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 in well, it still is a thing in, in, in offline rendering is time the first pixel, like how much time it takes to, to, to prep your scene before you start actually seeing pixels drop on your, in your scene. And if you do a really efficient, beautiful tree, it takes a little more time to make that tree, <laughs> tree work. So it's fascinating. Uh, well, that's really cool. Are, are you guys exploring real time ray tracing or maybe you, or you can't tell me that's fine. I'm sure you can't tell me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I obviously can't can't talk too right. much about uh, sort of stuff we haven't announced, but right. um, I, I think I can say that you know over the past few years it's been an area that's extremely interesting to us, uh, right. and yeah, s stay tuned. Okay, and yeah, absolutely. Now the other thing that I'm finding interesting, especially now because I've been exploring uh, some new CPUs, obviously, right? And you mentioned you have your all your own CPUs, and and you guys have tuned them for that, but. Now suddenly there is these CPUs that have 64 cores on them or 128 cores and 128 threads. And that is that CPU is starting to feel a lot more like a GPU. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know what I mean? And it's quite amazing to, to have that much performance out of a CPU as long as you write code that actually takes advantage of it because I have had some programs, for example, I have basically, I have a thread ripper that, I'm, uh, mm -hmm. that I've been uh, uh, testing uh, thanks to the guys at Lenovo and AMD that have been having me do stuff. And it's really great. And V-Ray, it's all firing, it's all going, it's all great. But some other programs, it only uses one core and it's really frustrating when you have 100, 128 threads and you only see one little thread going. So how is that? How is the world of like, are, are, as, as code right now, especially in the, in the computer graphics, are, are, is there still a challenge to making things multi-threaded and take advantage of all of these, uh, these, these cores or this availability down the line? Yeah, for sure. Um... So, so the interesting thing about ray tracing is that uh, when you first learn about ray tracing in school, that like the first thing that the professor tells you is like, oh, ray tracing is so easy to parallelize. It's like a, it's an embarrassingly parallel problem. Because, embarrassingly parallel, yep. yeah. <laughs> um, but it turns out that like in every like real world renderer, it, 
that's not quite true <laughs> Okay. <laughs> because, right. um, you know, th there's a whole bunch of stuff that the render has to do. That's much more difficult to thread, like, uh, like displacement, um, right. or, or if you, you know, a a every, uh, production renderer has, um, an out of core texture caching system because usually production texture sets are way bigger than main memory. So you have to have a way to right. load in texture tiles and MIP levels yep. and that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's something that is harder to parallelize because there's like, you know, lot contention that has to be dealt with. And you need to make sure that all the threads kind of have the same view of the cache. And um, yep. yeah, so, so all these problems kind of make the, the actual like day-to-day -day real world implementation of path tracing, ray tracing more difficult to parallelize. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, uh, so I, I think that um, kind of going back to V-Ray GPU for a moment, uh, I yeah. think it's V-Ray is, I think it was a few years ago where you guys uh, enabled V-Ray GPU to run on the CPU. Uh, yes. Which. That was done by, not by accident, but it was, what we did was it was specifically the reason it happened is because V-Ray CP, uh, V-Ray GPU, especially written in CUDA, was uh, very hard to debug when yeah. a crash happened, <laughs> right? So we wrote a version of V-Ray that was basically very close uh, uh, in, in C so that we could at least debug it and we could get, squash the bugs a lot easier. And they're like, well, why don't we just add the CPU yeah. <laughs> to, to that? And then it became a different one. Yeah, so we basically hybrid it. Yeah, so so I yeah. think what's, what's really cool and really interesting about that is that um, as multi-threaded, CPUs start to have like hundreds and hundreds of cores. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the sort of constraints and problems you run into begin to look very similar to a lot of the problems and constraints you run into in, in GPU code. So it turns out that like well optimized GPU code often actually is a better starting point for like super high core count multi-threaded CPUs than, than you would initially guess. And, and so um, there's a variety of reasons, but one of the interesting reasons is because um, memory access on the GPU is a big, big deal. Um, the yeah. actual GPU chip is like way faster than the speed that GPU memory can be read from. And so like the real challenge in writing GPU code often isn't actually like the GPU code. It's just like making sure that you can feed data to the GPU code fast enough to not just bog down the whole thing. Um, right. You know, part of like where uh, this like uh, many kernel approach to ray tracing comes from is influenced by like, you know, this constraint. Um, Interesting. And it turns out that on once you get like very high core count CPU systems, it's very similar. Like there's only a certain amount of memory bandwidth and memory can only run at a certain speed. And if you can't feed all of these cores fast enough, then you effectively slow down to the speed of memory access instead of like the actual speed the chip can run at. So right. since this has been a problem on the GPU side for so long, um, mm -hmm. GPU code is often very carefully written to, to consider this. Um, mm -hmm. And then now this is, that this is becoming a problem on the CPU side more and more, it makes sense that you know, lessons from the GPU side suddenly translate very well to the CPU side. There's this kind of whole right. uh, new sort of uh, philosophy in the, in the programming world called uh, data-oriented design, um, okay. which was kind of established by this guy named Mike Acton, who used to be at Insomniac Games, and now he's at Unity. Um, okay. So the idea behind data-oriented design is basically like, uh, if you really want to optimize for performance, um, you need to understand the data access patterns of your program. Uh, because fundamentally, okay. all a program really is, is a thing that reads in data, does some transformation and applies it to that data and writes out more data and reads more data, right? right? Yep. So if you, if you view programming from this philosophy of like, oh, well, really it, all that matters is like the data manipulation, then to understand like how to make the program efficient, you need to understand how to make the data access and the data patterns efficient. Um, okay. And so uh, data-oriented design leads to a lot of, um, it leads to a lot of ideas like, uh, you know, when you have, whenever you have one operation, it's actually better if you can do that one operation over repeatedly over and over again, over a large swath of data, instead of like doing that operation over a small piece of data and then doing a different operation over a different piece of data and then coming back to this right. one. 
because computers are really good at um, you know doing one thing over and over and over again. Um, right. And um, yeah, well, so, insom- so it's interesting. So Insomniac did the Spider-Man game, and that yeah. was a huge amount of data. So that's probably a lot of why that philosophy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, happens. exactly. Right. Um, but it, it turns out that like uh, for for rendering, it's the same thing. Like really, all if you think about like at a deep level, what a what a path tracer is doing, mm-hmm. it's firing rays against the scene, which is just essentially random memory access over all of your geometry. And then right. it's like writing a bunch of results to somewhere else in memory. And then it's reading a bunch of texture data to drive shaders. And then it's firing off rays to go intersect more geometry, which is reading more geometry. Um, right. And uh, yeah, like, you know, breaking up a render into a many kernel architecture ends mm-hmm. up being really good for this because now instead of like every single thread doing a completely different thing, you can make sure that all threads are all like just, you know, doing a loop over accessing geometry all at the same time. Right. So, you know, you're always like, like the only memory operation you're doing is reading from geometry. Um, right. And then like, you know, same thing with textures and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's that, that's fascinating. I'm really curious about, about how that, that that's going to be, because I think, you know, obviously, you know, Hyperion is sort of the way you were describing it sounds like, oh, huh, well, it sounds like Hyperion would actually take it advantage i mean what was it almost 10 years ago well no hyperion i guess was about yeah almost 10 years ago that it started right yeah approximately <laughs> so 10 years ago a, 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 a 64 core uh cpu did not exist right if you maybe had four maybe eight cores <laughs> at most right so you're i'm wondering like how much better the performance would of hyperion would be now that these new cores or does it have to be like oh we have to rewrite it again to really take advantage of this or is it like oh no we were already on that path and that's gonna we're just gonna keep doing a, a good uh a, you know moving in that path i'm just curious about how you feel that hyperion will perform on those that type of hardware um Hyperion's definitely not perfect at at scaling to extremely high thread counts. Okay. Um, a lot of that just comes with like, you know, kind of like you said, you know, when it was first written, these like ultra high right. core count machines didn't exist. So even though like a lot of the stuff in Hyperion's overall philosophy and architecture lines up very well with this sort of like yep. data oriented design philosophy, um, yeah. the actual practical implementation, you know, often differs because yep. it kind of just predates a lot of this. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. something that we're definitely like putting a lot of work into and putting a lot of thought into, but it's also like a, yeah, there, there's, uh, there's definitely room for improvement. Well, I'm very, I'm very excited about, about what you guys are doing. Obviously, you know, uh, the, 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 the look of what uh, Disney has, uh, has done has been, has, has changed a lot. It's been really quite breathtaking. Uh, the amount of detail you guys are throwing. I mean, we obviously you know Alex Nishma. He's been on. I've yeah. talked to him about lighting, and about all he all the things he's done in that area. So it's really really exciting uh, to see to see all that uh, that content. And Zootopia was also with Hyperion, right? Uh, well, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, because that was oh, it was a lot of stuff <laughs> going yeah. on in Zootopia. It was a lot of stuff going on. So it was really cool to see that. I'm really excited about about seeing that what that that renderer can do and to look to it can achieve. So it's pretty, it's pretty great. So, uh, really excited. Listen, we're, we're over an hour and I don't want to take too much over, uh, too much more of your time, but this has been really cool to have you on and to talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, I can't wait to share this with Vlado to hear what he has to say (laughs) and his thoughts on this. I'm sure he's going to be very excited to have, to have that, uh, that on as well. And, uh, so it's been cool. How's been working from home doing this code from home? Has that been, uh, working out for you? Um, yeah, it's um, yeah. Well, so so I'm by nature I'm a bit of an introvert. So when we first started working from home, I was like, "This is great!" Like I, I sure. everybody can walk into my office and disturb me, and I can just do my thing. Um, yeah. But kind of the longer it's gone on, the more I'm like, "Oh man, I really miss being in the studio, and I miss seeing everybody, and I miss being able to like, you know, go directly to an artist's desk whenever they have a problem to help them out." Or I, I miss Alex Nijima walking into my office with like a cool idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he and I actually uh, uh, work pretty closely. 
Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, that's what I'm assuming because he does a lot of the R and D work kind of stuff, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Like he he was uh, super instrumental on like the the new volume rendering system we developed a few years yep. back. He was yeah, he yeah, was yeah. like our user number zero or number one or really? something like that. Yeah. Nice. This is yeah because didn't he do the Moana Cloud? Like that's the the, yep. the free. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. So yeah, that that go. was actually developed hand in hand with the new volume rendering system. Like, right. I think the way, if I remember correctly, the way it actually played out was uh, he made the cloud, couldn't <laughs> render it to look right, came over to our desks and was like, "Hey guys, like, what the heck?" And then right. that led us to like you know start the research that kind of um, led to the new volume rendering system. And then like there was this long period of time where like he was iterating on the cloud and we were iterating on the code at the same time and just like constantly swapping code and you know, the latest version of his data sets. Um, wow. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's really it, awesome. It's, it's harder <laughs> to do that from home because yeah. a lot of that was yeah. just like, I would show up at his office or he would show up in our office or. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I get it. I get it. It's, <laughs> it sucks. It sucks. But, but yeah, it's great. Well, listen, listen, Carl, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, it was really cool to hear your whole backstory and then you just giving us your, you know, your thoughts on ray tracing and where that goes, because I think those are really great subjects to talk about and definitely great for this podcast. So, uh, uh I'm excited to have, uh, to have the, uh, have you on. It was, and we, you and I have actually exchanged a couple of emails before. Yeah. So it was kind of fun as like, we really should have you on. <laughs> and, uh, so now it's finally happened. I think it's been like two or three years since we, since we first started talking. So it's been really great to, to do that. Yeah. Thanks. So, thanks but, so much for having me on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thanks, thanks show, for being so. here. <laughs> cool. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> <laughs>